Good morning, it's Richard Edelman from New York. I am joined by a distinguished panel of chief executives, uh, academics, government officials, and uh, Kirsty Graham, my cohort who runs public affairs at Edelman. I'm gonna run through the slides of the special report Edelman Trust Barometer first, and then turn it over to uh, Kirsty for the panel. I wanted to explain to you why we decided to do this special study. As you'll recall in January, business had ascended to the highest position of trust in the 20 years that we had seen um, the history of the trust barometer. And things have changed profoundly. Um, we did an interim report, as you'll recall, four weeks ago, in which it was clear that there were new expectations of business, specifically to be an information source, also to be a responsible employer, to keep people at home, to keep them safe, to make sure they had PPE, but also, <clears throat> most important, to try to guard their jobs. So that was the expectations. And what we'll show you today is some disappointment in business, actually, warranted or not, um, and a stunning rise in trust in government. So um, first, next slide, Polly. What you'll see in this chart is that every, every country we studied out of 11 countries went up in trust. We studied countries in Asia, uh, in the Middle East, in Latin America, in the US and Canada, and Europe. So across the entire world, trust in institutions rose. In fact, we actually believe this is a trust bubble, that people are so scared, so afraid, that they are casting their lots into the closest lifeboat. And in fact, it's the highest trust score we have ever seen in an aggregate sense across all four institutions of business, government, media, and NGOs. Next slide. So what you see is what goes up quickly tends to come down quickly. We do believe that this is a bubble, that by Christmas, we'll see a significant deterioration in trust scores. We'll show you the sort of castles in the air scenario. Um, we want to explain where specifically business can actually buffer its position, um, but there's no question that this is a peak moment for trust in institutions, which may to you sound contradictory, but when people are scared, they grab onto something and then they become discontented. So let's go into some of the specific statistics. There are a lot of fears out there. And the first fear is keep me safe. And neither business nor government is doing a perfect job of that, specifically on getting protective equipment, and also in protecting workers. And so there's big discontent um, about health. Next slide. There's big fear of job loss. So again, you'll remember in January that we showed you that 80% of your employees were going to work concerned ultimately about job loss related to automation, to globalization, to immigration or other. And that led to concerns about downward economic mobility. The new fear, is COVID-related job loss, warranted by a 17% unemployment rate in the US and spreading elsewhere. So 56% of people globally are now worried about job loss related to the pandemic. Next slide. On top of that, the fears about fake news continue to metastasize. In fact, we find that two thirds of people are worried about fake news, making it impossible for them to get adequate information. About half the people find that it's very difficult to find reliable and trustworthy information, which I want to reiterate is part of the responsibility of the corporation to talk to your employees and give them information that they can spread around the world. Next slide. Here's something very important, the mass class divide. We've been talking to you about this for four years. It started in the US, UK and France, then started to spread into Canada, Germany, et cetera in the last year into Asia, into India, into the Middle East, into Saudi Arabia. Now it's transversal. Basically, there's a real sense that this disease has proven the inequity between the wealthy and the working poor. That in fact, those with less education, less resource, et cetera, are being unfairly burdened and that something must be done, not Bernie Sanders style, but something has to be done in terms of more fair distribution of the world's resources. Next slide. Okay, this is a revolution in the landscape of trust. For the first time, 
in the 20 years we've been studying trust, government is the most trusted institution in the world. We'll explain why in a moment, but this rise of 11 points across every country in the world in government is staggering. We've not seen anything like this kind of jump. Of course, we've not seen anything like this kind of problem. Government is seen as sort of, to go back to the old Hobbes, you know, basically, we're going to take care of you. There'll be certain trade-offs with that, but, you know, we're big government. Big government is back, reversing 40 years of Reagan, Thatcher, and deregulation. Next slide. The most divided country in the world, no surprise, is the United States. I want you again to see the magnitude of these divisions, working right to left, starting with media. The Democrats see media as the last retaining wall of truth in this country. The Republicans see it as the next thing to Satan, um, because there's only Fox and that's the truth. And I'm exaggerating to make the point that there's a real concern about the quality of information. And look also about the attitudes to federal government. What you see is that federal government attitudes among Democrats is really low. The gap is made up by very high trust in local government. So A plus B adds up to a pretty good number for Democrats. For Republicans, there's a big jump in trust in the federal government and they have always trusted state and local. There's also a big difference in attitude, let's go back probably for one second, um, on attitudes to NGOs, much higher trust among Democrats than Republicans. So again, I wanna reiterate, on media, there's a battle for truth, there's an R view and a D view, and never the twain shall meet, we need to talk to both. And we need to talk to both in a respectful manner. Next slide. Government is seen as the strongest institution to lead across all aspects of this pandemic. So contain the pandemic, inform the public, provide economic relief, help people cope and get this country back to normal. You should have thought, for instance, that media might be the biggest source of information. Nope, it's government. You should have thought that business was the one to provide economic relief and support. Nope, it's government. So in short, it's government all the time right now. Next. Trust in news in mainstream media is at an all time high. People are watching TV. They are reading intently. They desperately want information, but they're actually deeply suspicious. It takes five times now to hear, see, or read something before you believe it because you're trying to articulate throughout the day what you're hearing from social sources versus mainstream sources. I give the mainstream media a huge credit for what they've done. It's a business problem because their advertising is diving, but they're doing a really good job. Social media continues to have problems of trust related to fake news. Next slide. A call for expert voices. There's a deep desire for expertise. Take a look at doctor, scientist, national health officials. The WHO has been deeply wounded by this allegation that they are too close to the Chinese and protecting the Chinese about the origin of the disease. That's a decline in the number for WHO trust. And by the way, importantly, CEOs are much less trusted than scientists. This is important for all of you thinking about your communications. CEO plus expert. Next slide. NGOs. NGOs are a vital part of getting relief to the public. For example, Unilever is partnering with Feeding America to distribute food in three weeks. However, next slide. We see that there's a real problem for NGOs on the perception of execution. Um, so in short, NGOs need to be sure that they're seen as competent, capable, and worthy of people continuing to give money. Next slide. Okay, one, go back one. This is the moment of reckoning for business. In the last three months, think about this as a bike race. Business has been able to go behind the lead bicycle, which has been government, which has shielded business from the wind. But in the next months, we're gonna have business making very important decisions. For Oscar, for example, do we put masks on people who fly on United planes? If, if we're considering uh, travel and tourism, 
Um, if you're Hilton, do you require a health passport in order to get into a hotel? If you're Yum, do you rearrange the seating areas of your restaurants such that there's less density? If you're Herman Miller, do you help business to create a different look within the office such that there's barriers, plastic or other, um, in a way that makes the open office actually viable? And if you're Edelman, do you have the same density of number of people on each floor when we first go back to work? And do we wear masks and gloves, et cetera? So this is it, folks. It's our time to lead. We can't just draft behind government anymore. Next slide. So I wanna start this off by saying that business has actually been hurt by its absence in the last months of dialogue. I completely understand keeping your head down, doing your work and making sure you have a viable business. But we need public leadership now. There's a big expectation, 65% of CEOs to act and not just wait for mama government. However, only 29% of respondents said that CEOs are doing an outstanding job to meet the demands placed on them during this pandemic. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a big watch out sign. We need to get that number back up to the mid fifties where it was before the crisis. Next slide. Business is failing the test of competence so far. Protection of employees, ensuring we have the products we need, and most of all, preparing for the eventual recovery. What is it we're going to do? How are we gonna keep people safe as well as make money? People want to know. We have it within our power to communicate this. We need to do so urgently. So competence, as you'll recall, is the thing that business had as its biggest trust building asset for January and why we were propelled upwards in the trust score. Next slide. Where business historically has been lower is on integrity, putting people before profits. Here we score 38%, not good enough. Also, helping small business. I wanna commend Unilever in particular for extending credit to its small business supply chain, giving them longer uh, terms. That's really smart. That's the sort of thing we need to do to show that we are a stakeholder and not just a shareholder oriented institution. Next slide. <clears throat> to build trust, business must be seen as leading in the fight against the pandemic. Yes, donations, HP commending you a lot for donating your 3D printers to hospitals that were short of masks, bravo. We also though need to collaborate with competitors. Oscar will talk about that, about the airlines and redefining your purpose and your goals such that you're seen as long-term capitalists, not short-term, and that you have a mission to fight this pandemic, that you're absolutely committed to a long-term view. Next. I find it fascinating that the industries that are on the front lines have the biggest bump in trust. So example, food and beverage, healthcare, <clears throat> retailers, CPG, big jumps in trust. There's a reason that people are going out and banging um, pots and pans at 7 p.m. in New York. Yes, it's for the healthcare workers, but it's also for the garbage men and for all the people working in the factories who are turning out the essential products. American business is doing the job and people are giving you credit for this. And this is a global phenomenon as well. Next slide. But it's also clear that business has to work with government. So in fact, it's, if it's a bike race, it's better to finish together than one ahead of the other. Big watch out, by three to one, we wanna be sure that business is conservative about the call back to work. We wanna be sure that there are no outbreaks caused by business. And again, by three to one, health authorities over CEOs making that decision. That is entirely correct. Next slide. <clears throat> People get it. The priority is health and safety, and ultimately, we will have a good economy if we are able to count on controlling COVID. By two to one, you can see health over starting the economy up immediately. Next slide. And also, there are big expectations of government, more medical supplies, bigger health care spending, health screenings for anyone coming into the country, and restricting international travel until the pandemic is over. Again, protect us. It's not just about business, not just about revenue. 
Next slide. So here's the chart that we introduced in January, and I hope that you find this an important guide to your own behavior and your advice to your CEO. Competence on the x-axis and ethical behavior on the y-axis. What we see in the last months is that government, which was in the bottom left corner deeply buried, has actually moved almost to the middle. Business has moved backwards in terms of competence and no, not upwards in terms of ethics. NGOs hardly moved, media hardly moved. Our goal, the top right quadrant, I believe that business can get there with a very strong showing in the reopening to a new normal, not the normal, but to a new normal. And that communicators are gonna be an urgent part of that strategy forward. Because if you don't understand, you'll never believe and trust. Next slide. Therefore, we need tangible actions. For example, Starbucks, Yum, others, they're rearranging their store footprints. It's a clear sign of different. Business and government together, not separated. We cannot have a blame game between business and government about, well, the stores reopened and that's why the outbreaks happened and, you know, no, together. Business has to live up to its promise from the business roundtable last August about being multi-stakeholder. This is an urgent time for business as a force for good, as well as making money. CEOs, please get out there and lead publicly. We need you to explain what the new normal looks like. We can't just intuit this. We need you to be out there. And lastly, the return for work is our time. I sound like a, a sports coach, but I can't be more passionate about this. This is our moment to shine. We need to do this well. Kirsty, over to you. Thank you, Richard, and good morning, everybody. Um, that is a fascinating set of data, and there's a lot to reflect on. So to help offer perspective on the findings, I'm joined by a panel representing different institutions and indeed different sectors. So we have with us today Phil Hogan, who is the European Commissioner for Trade, Oscar Munez, the CEO of United Airlines, Andy Owen, the president and CEO of Herman Miller, David Gibbs, CEO of Yum Brands, and Professor Luigi Zingales, the director of the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Thank you for being with me today. And what I'm going to do is ask a couple of questions of each panelist, and then we will open it up for Q&A from you all. I'd like to start with you, Commissioner Hogan. Can you hear me? Can, Christy, yes. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Uh, as you're here and a representative of government, um, I wanted to begin by asking you about this extraordinary surge you see in trust for government, up 11 points. What do you read into that and into the permissions that are being given to government in this moment? And do you see that trust lasting? Well, after 32 years being involved in politics in Ireland, I'm delighted to see that government is now finding the finding its stride in terms of actually a crisis uh, has uh, brought out the best in terms of government leadership. And I think by government, people are interpreting that as the frontline services and the public services and the civil servants and all of them working together to keep people alive and help save lives, keep them safe uh, and giving guidelines and leadership to various people in relation to what they should do and how they should uh, behave in order to ensure that they keep not just themselves safe, but also their, their families and their neighbours and their communities. So it's, uh, it's good to see this and it shows, uh, it shows you the depth of the crisis uh, that the people rely on institutions and governments in order to, and they, they trust them in terms of the work that they have to do together in order to achieve that. So I think that the, the continuation uh, of this particular trust, of course, will be difficult because uh, well, if people tell it as it is, uh, it won't be difficult, but normally this is not what happens. And that the economic and financial aspects of this po uh, post-COVID-19 pandemic will come into play in the, in the next couple of months and where inevitably the financial supports will taper off. And therefore, people will be looking for somebody else to give them the necessary, I suppose, financial support when governments will not have the, will have run out of money in large extent. And, and then people will be paying more taxes in order to pay the bill. Uh, but nevertheless, it's good to see that there is a high level of trust in our public services and our health services, and rightly so. 
when we when we actually looked at the data, there are some interesting trends about people believing in questions around supply chain reliability and the sense of turning to local more often. You know, we already knew uh, that there was a rise in nationalism uh, and populism, you know, before we entered COVID. So I'm intrigued, given the position you have in global trade, how do you think those trends are going to impact the architecture around international trade? Well, inevitably, when you have a crisis, people will hanker down and they will uh, look inwards uh, and become more protectionist, and especially around health, which is understandable. Uh, and we see that uh, in, in the context of health-related supplies, that there is uh, certainly a, an underestimation of what we need and the stockpiles that we need in order to ensure that we're ready for any pandemic uh, in the health area. So I expect that there will be a, a continuation of uh, the, 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 the desire for people to have uh, a focus on where we have been vulnerable in this crisis and on those sectors and those products where we require to diversify away from perhaps uh, one preferred option or one preferred region in order to ensure that we have lo more localized production in the short term and certainly in health related areas. Uh, in the same way as we had a problem with oil supplies in the 1970s, where there was a 90 day uh, reserve uh, was the outcome of a various discussions between countries at that time. I think this is most, something similar we need in the health related area. And we need to reduce the costs of medical supplies and medical equipment as well through reducing or eliminating tariffs and VAT and whatever costs that are associated for countries and the consumer. But I do, I do at the end of the day, I think that there will be, uh, you know, uh, in the European Union side, we have a lot of partners, 73 countries around the world where we have free trade agreements. And we will be emphasizing the need to continue to ensure that we remove the restrictions that were put in place in the last 10 weeks. We actually open up to the opportunities we have around the world uh, in order to, to, with the free trade agreements that we have. And this is the only way which has been proven in the past where open rules-based trade is the vehicle by which we can actually grow our economies, get back our jobs and open up to the potential that there is there at the uh, in the future in terms of where we can do business. So exports contribute to 35 million jobs in the, in the, in the European Union and we depend on foreign investment for 16 million jobs. That's a huge part of any country's economy. So, so one final question, Commissioner, before I move on to, to others. Um, you mentioned tariffs, and I think there's hardly any business in the world that isn't impacted by the relationship between US and China. Now, that relationship was strained uh, prior to COVID with the trade dis and tariff disputes. What role is Europe going to play in resetting that relationship? Well, we're against tariffs, as you know, uh, from the point of view of solving uh, disputes. Uh, we don't believe that there's a role for tariffs. It reduces economic activity and jobs. And I think it's counterproductive. And uh, we are trying to convince the United States of this particular matter for a little while. Uh, and we continue to try and do so. And uh, we should be working closely together in order to level the playing field and reduce the costs of doing business together as Western democracies. And where we have a huge relationship with each other. We're by far the highest trading partner of the European Union is the United States and, by, and vice versa. 65% of our foreign direct investment from the European Union goes to the United States, and about 60% from the United States to the European Union. So whether we like it or not, or whether we talk about balance of goods and, and balance of trade deficits, uh, at the end of the day, we have a lot of companies, a lot of employment, depending on each other, and we should be cooperating together more closely, rather than perhaps than confronting each other. And by reducing costs, reducing tariffs, and greater cooperation, we can do a lot together in order to ensure that our economies come out of this problem more quickly. Thank you. That's a very interesting perspective. And I'm going to shift gears now and go to Oscar. Oscar, your industry has been at the front line of the ravages of COVID. And I wanted to begin by asking you, how do we rebuild trust and have people get back into planes and to travel? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Kirsty, um, you know, we are, as an industry, facing one of the, if not the worst global financial industry crisis we've ever faced, threefold. 9-11 uh, in the U.S. was sort of the black swan moment for the industry. Uh, we are in a position around the world where, um, frankly, survival is going to be the operative term. Uh, I say that as a preamble because it, it sort of sets me up for any question you might ask after that, because we do have that, that sort of focus and point to be around indeed when this thing returns. And, and, and of course, we don't know 
Um, I think uh, when we when we talk about the things that we do, safety has always been at the top of, of our list for everything we've done. It's one of the safest industries out there. Um, this is a whole brand new concept of safety. And I think what you'll see and what you're seeing already, certainly from United, is all the things that you would have to see. The, the cleanliness of the aircraft, these are spotless. They're being defogged and sprayed and everybody's wearing gloves. And we've made all sorts of changes to how we interact with you to avoid uh, any direct contact, maintain social distancing. I mean, somebody mentioned the face mask, and so on and so forth. And so that'll happen, it'll happen across the industry. And I think we'll be uh, relatively big. So that's the literal answer to your question, if I might. Um, I'd like to separate tactics, which is what I just discussed, which are relatively short-term in nature, from trust, which is a much more longer-term sort of relationship aspect, right? And I think that's a divide and balance that we have to make. Um, if I think about it, air travel dropped to zero, not because of anything other than we shut the economies down. Um, there was nothing, it was a necessary tactical response. Um, people didn't stop flying because they didn't trust us. And the power to close is different than the power to open. And so while we didn't lose any trust on the way down, we have to regain all of the trust on the way back, is what, which is what you'll see us doing all the right things uh, within our industry to make it safe for you to feel safe, uh, to reach out and communicate. But importantly, um, and I could talk about it endlessly, uh, it, despite the survival mode that we're on, our industry, certainly United, is doing so many things. As I listened to Richard's, uh, a concept on where CEOs should be focusing and the things that we're doing to repatriate individuals that are stranded, to fly cargo with necessary medical supplies, uh, with putting our people power, people that aren't working right now. I have 100,000 folks that there's maybe 10,000 of them that are actually physically working because our business has dropped 96 percent. Um, and so as we think about rebuilding trust, it's a combination of those, the tactical things, but also working in conjunction with others to create this broader trust aspect about not just flying, but the destinations you're headed to are also safe. So it's a broad range of, of, of uh, subjects and, uh, and objectives. So, so Oscar, you, you also touched on you know, what you've been doing, not just as, as United, but as an industry. And one of the interesting data points that came through in the survey is the sense of collaboration and that no one institution can do, come up with the solutions on their own. So you have been working very closely with government and another theme has also been working with competitors. Can you say a little bit about how you at United have approached this in terms of the conversations you have with government and with your, with your peers? Yeah, I, I think it's been a, a, a matter of, again, I use the term survival again. I think we all came to that conclusion at different times. So part of the collaboration is knowing exactly what you just outlined, that all of us together are infinitely better than one of us individually. So we did collectively as a, as a US uh, based set of airlines combine together to go to the government to uh, educate and help them understand the severity of this problem. When you have a business as large as ours and it drops to nearly zero, and frankly, from at least my perspective at United, um, without a vaccine or herd immunity, um, demand is never is not going to return to the levels that we had before. We ha we fly 180 million people all over the world, 12 and a half flights to China from the U.S., 17 flights to Heathrow. Um, there is just no way that level of demand is coming back anytime soon. So we have to absolutely prepare for the worst while hope for the future. And therein lies this trust aspect that, uh, that we've discussed. Uh, we have to be so honest and forthright where unfortunately people don't want to hear what we have to say. I have to tell them that come later this fall, unless demand has returned in a significant way, we're going to have to take a lot of, of, of drastic measures, frankly. Um, and so working with others uh, in, the, in the front end to gain funding, uh, to do things from a safety perspective that we've come out with recently, that we shouldn't, should not ever compete on issues of safety. We shouldn't put you, the flying public, in a position where I'm going to pick brand X versus brand Y because I think they're safer. That shouldn't be the case. Flying and flying an aircraft should be, uh, should be common. That should be the last of your decisions. And so we'll collaborate on those things. But with regards to how we survive and the actions we'll take, that's going to be a continued uh, a conversation and a significant one.
That's an incredible perspective. Thank you very much for those comments. It, it really is thought provoking when you think of the scale of what's in front of us. I'm going to shift gears and go to you, Andy, uh, at Herman Miller, you know, as an innovation and design company. And when we think about return to work, and if we think about it in the office setting, um, what do you think that looks like? And I'm sure you saw a piece today in the New York Times that, you know, speculated <laughs> on what it looks like. Um, whether there may be no more open plan. What's your thinking on what return to work in the office looks like? You know, it's a, it's a great question, and I think all of us are leaning in to try to figure it out. I think since the start of this crisis, there's really been a seesaw conversation about keeping employees healthy and safe, and also keeping the economy healthy. So I think we probably can all agree that safety and health come first. So I think Oscar referred to uh, simple things like PPE, whether it's masks, and gloves and all of those things. But if I, if I put that to one side, I think as we think about the workplace, one of the things that's really, really important is that most organizations need to, through this crisis and into the future, think about sustainable environments that will be engaging for employees where people can work both individually and together. And this really hasn't changed very much. So we really have to think about how we have to design productive work environments that are different, but will also help keep employees engaged. So we've been thinking about the where of work for a very long time. So prior to, to COVID starting, work was beginning to be distributed anyway. We were already using technology to work in a variety of places. The workplace was changing dramatically. So this has just pushed that kind of distributed model of work a little bit further along in the process. And listen, I don't think the answer is a one-size-fits-all solution. Listen, my company invented the cubicle for good, better or worse. So I could say, you know, put up cubicles, put up walls, but I, I think it's a little bit different. I think we have to think about each environment. We have to think about the kind of work that's being done. You know, we like to say that in this crisis, the me has won and the we has lost. So for those of us that can work uh, in solitary and individually heads down focused work in an environment in our home, fantastic. For those of us that need to collaborate and use each other to have innovative ideas, it's been a little bit harder. So there's a couple of things we have to really think about. We have to use data as we think about returning to the workplace to determine who comes back to work first. So things like how much personal person interaction does each team require? How much of that is critical to their success? How well are the teams that are working away from the workplace doing? Do they need more technology, less technology? You know, some of us are finding as we're working in our home environments that we have roommates or we have families or we have things that are distracting. So when you think about who you're bringing back and how you're bringing people back, we have to think about staggering that workforce, uh, not only with what we need them to do, but how they're most successful. So there's a couple of things we're also thinking about. And I think when you, when you start to look at the design of the workplace, that's one critical element. Another element is really, how do you put in holistic community measures that can really help you think differently about the workplace as we start to bring us back. So for example, um, you might immediately say spread everyone out six feet or more, but really what you should be thinking about is how many people are actually in the workplace. So how can you limit the number of people that are there, that are there at one time? How can you stagger the amount of people that are in the workplace? And then think about the flow of the workspace. So, you know, we're manufacturers of furniture, so we think about flow and space as it relates to efficiency all the time. But when you think about a workspace or an office environment, it's a very fluid environment, which you can't really control where people are going. What are they doing in the break room or the restroom? So when you think about hallways and spaces and making them one way versus multi-way. So I think when you think about these holistic community level decisions, these are really where we have to start in addition to spacing and office design. So you've certainly laid out a number of issues there for, for when you think about returning to work from an employee perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm also curious in your views on, you know, from a customer perspective and having showrooms and having physical places, you know, where do you see the balance between retail and online sales going? You know, I've, I've definitely been involved in uh, the impact of digital and online sales in the retail environment for a long time. And I think COVID-19 has really just sort of moved us from the road we are on to the super highway of digital change. You know, the things that some of us may have had on our uh, digital roadmap for the next three years, uh, we're probably all putting into place in the next two or three months. So when I think about what we're doing now and how we're all living, um, the silver lining in this cloud is that I think it's shown all of us from a 
company and customer perspective how we can live differently. So for those of us that might not have spent the majority of our lives online before, now we're glued to video conferences all day. My 80 year old mother is ordering her groceries on an app. Things are just very, very different. So the solutions that we're, we're using now and the problems that we have now have introduced a whole new way to live and a whole new way to shop from a retail perspective. So I don't think a supercharged digital retail um, solution is going anywhere anytime fast. I think in fact, that all of the ways that we are interacting online and shopping online will do nothing but get more important to us in the future. And I think uh, if, if you haven't already started working on that from a retail perspective, you need to. The second part of that, in addition to having a really incredible digital experience, is the fact that this experience for all of us, I think, has brought out the importance of human interaction. So as we spend more and more time alone or with our families in solitary confinement, I think what many of us miss is that day-to-day -day human interaction. And I remember reading a study a couple of years ago that talked about happiness and longevity. And the things that made it to the top of the list were things like family and close friendships. But some of the more important things were those small daily social interactions that you have with the person you get your coffee from with the person in your grocery store, uh, with your dry cleaner. So these interactions and having them on a regular basis really contribute to health, happiness, and longevity. So I think when we think about a retail future and a consumer future, bricks and mortar isn't going to go away. I think it will be radically different. But I think how we imbue those two things, how we take a digital experience, which is where we'd be spending so much time, and imbue that with a human connection is going to be really, really critical. And, and I'll I'll give you an example. You know, before COVID started, we had started to launch a platform that enabled people that were shopping online to actually also uh, get in touch in a virtual way with someone in a studio. And we thought it'll be interesting, but we, we happened to launch it a couple of weeks before COVID struck. And what we found is yes, people are shopping online more, but the ability to actually connect with someone virtually and to have that experience along with the digital experience creates a sense of trust and it creates a much more interesting experience for those customers. So I think it'll be a blend going forward of both retail, online, and bricks and mortar. So, so you've said a number of things that I think are very thoughtful, including the, you know, the absence and how humans need that interaction and also the acceleration of many issues and trends that we knew were coming to our society have just gone faster. I'm going to, I'm going to jump over to you, David. Um, and when I say jump, uh, you know, your sector, food and beverage, has seen a big trust uh, movement upwards because I, I assume people see you very much on the front lines. Can you say a little bit about what you think the future of hospitality in a COVID world looks like? Yeah, I think our industry has been one that um, people are still interacting with to the point that Andy made. People are still able to interact with restaurants, but it's in a different form. And that's probably contributing to the trust um, because I think the industry in general has handled this well in terms of reacting quickly. Uh, as far as what do we see on the future of hospitality, this word of, that you're throwing around a lot, trust, and that you're well known for um, is one that we talk about a lot. If you think about the restaurant experience before all of this, you had a, a level of trust in restaurants in your communities that was really a given. There was, it didn't, nobody had to work hard for it. Uh, you, if the health department let you open, they, you were trusted. Uh, the minute the crisis hit, we saw an interesting trend in that people trusted the familiar. So our brands that had more history operating in their markets did better than when they were newer in their country. We're in 140 countries with over 50,000 restaurants. We have 290 combinations of brands and countries. So each one of those, like Taco Bell, you know, Spain and KFC India, each one is a different you know, data point for us. So we have a good lens to see what, what consumers are doing. And what you found is when, you know, what we're finding is that when our brands have a high level of trust, uh, the consumers flock to them initially and they flock to the familiar products. So a bucket of chicken, uh, which has a long history of comfort food and normalcy uh, is something that sales started going up when we saw this hit. You know, so that, so to customers, familiarity was trust then. Then as, you know, as the crisis has unfolded, they're actually looking more for visual signs of trust in our restaurants. And that's why you see 
employees wearing masks and gloves and you know, sanitizer and all of the different things that we're doing to make uh, the customer understand that we value you know, their safety and the employee safety first and foremost. So it's now become what are the visual cues. But as we come out of this, some of the research that we're fielding is producing a result similar to what you're seeing. And that is customers purchase intent is very much related to how we're treating employees. They're, they're more altruistic now. They care more about their fellow human beings because the crisis does that to you when you see others suffering. Clearly that's part of it. But the other part of it is if you're treating your employee right, that means I can trust that employee to make my food safely. And we, we would not normally see purchase intent being so tied to you know, how the employees are being treated at each company. So we know to your question about the future of hospitality in a lot of industries, I think the role of how you treat your employee and how you're seen as an employer and also how you treat other members of the community uh, will go up in importance and be a big part of trust. The other thing which is probably more natural for people to expect is just uh, what's happened with technology. The way I've been describing it is it's three years worth of technology change wrapped up in three months. That's what we're seeing in our business. People want to di order digitally and they want to pay digitally. It's a safer way, it's low contact. And obviously once you do it a couple of times, you get used to it, it's just an easier way to experience our brand. So all of the trends that we had been preparing for before this crisis and what, the, what we thought the future of hospitality would look like down the road, you know, the future is here now when it comes to technology. Uh, but certainly, you know, the most important thing in our business with uh, 30 million customers a day, one and a half million team members around the world is, is goes back to that issue of how are we treating the employees? And that is going to be a big part of the future. Not, not just because it signals the trust in that they'll treat me well as a customer, but I think the issue that Richard talked about is, is front and center now in terms of uh, class divide. And, and that's getting exacerbated and, and highlighted by this the situation we're in. And we know as a huge company with a ton of uh, one and a half million employees, we can either be part of the solution or we can be part of the problem. And everything we're doing right now to get through this is take, putting our employees first, their safety, um, paying them hazard pay, all the different things that you would imagine good employers would do. I think that's going to be very important as you go forward. So one, one question, you know, I, I want to come back to the inequality one towards the end, but one question you did make me think of as you were talking, and it was the same one I asked the commissioner, what, what do you think of this trend or what we're seeing in terms of people wanting to go local from supply chain perspective? How will that impact hospitality? Well, we're fortunate in that our, in our business is very much sourced locally. We run a decentralized model. So our restaurants around the world get most of their supply locally. So we're not personally impacted, but, and I certainly agree with the commissioner that open trade is good for everybody in an ideal world. The, the challenge is local, locally sourced products tend to be cheaper to secure if there's appropriate supply. And I do think that this is a little bit of a wake up call for supply chain in that, you know, the, the disruption is more likely to be for something that's coming from far away um, that you have less control over. And you will probably will see a shift on supply chain to people looking for more local sourcing options and certainly uh, better contingency plans for certain products. So, so let's pick up on the on the inequality piece, and I want to go to you, Professor Zangalis. Um, you know, you you see this come through very much, very strongly in the data. Sixty four percent saying that they believe more needs to be done to fairly distribute uh, wealth and prosperity. What what does this mean for where we are heading uh, in terms of our models, and what do you expect government and business to do to address that? First of all, it's important to understand that this rise in trust is more out of necessity than out of love. Uh, in, uh, here, we're in a situation that we economists call of externality, where individual choices don't deliver uh, a good outcome. When I go out, if I am asymptomatic but I'm sick, I infect other people and I don't necessarily internalize this cost. This is where the government should intervene, where individual choices are enough and not sufficient. And two, uh, in the situation of pandemic is an alter situation of public good where we need to have uh, support infrastructure, vaccines, 
to benefit everybody. So this is the government high moment. Now, I don't think that many countries, the government are doing particularly well, but certainly is a moment where they are extremely needed. And uh, they also needed to uh, defend and protect uh, uh, a part of the population that is particularly exposed. And even if you don't do out of uh, uh, care, and you should, you do out of necessity. In the sense, the people that are not uh, taking care will spread the disease. So uh, we see that even in the United States, even President Trump is considering extending some form of Medicare to everybody because there is a strong externality. So in this moment, it's a moment of massive government intervention that is demanded by everybody and create the setup for more redistribution. And this redistribution, the demand for redistribution was there even before this pandemic, but I think it's gonna be much higher after this pandemic because uh, inequality is there and people are seeing the negative consequences, are seeing that it's possible to have the government involved in redistributing uh, as uh, they're doing now with uh, a lot of uh, uh, packages that are costing trillions of dollars. And I think that uh, uh, it's not gonna go away. And uh, a friend of mine would say, yes, we are all on the same boat, but some is in the luxury cabin and some is in the galley getting sick. And I think that uh, uh, there is more demand of feeling uh, all together and uh, redistribution is gonna be part of it. So, I mean, you know, when you you push the question on the on the role of government, do you believe as we go forward that the permissions that we're seeing people are comfortable with government having at the moment, do you see that continuing? That there will be a bigger role for government in business and in people's personal lives. I think that if history is uh, uh, useful, absolutely. And this is unfortunately, I have to say that this period looks very much like. Uh, the aftermath of World War I, uh, where uh, after a long period of uh, free markets, free trade uh, uh, and everything, we had a collapse in the world system and uh, back then uh, with a war and actually uh, also a pandemic, but the war was worse than a pandemic or actually both were terrible. And, uh, and after that, there was a huge demand for government intervention that leads to the rise of uh, uh, the socialist uh, um, uh, Russia, but also uh, fascist Italy and uh, the interventionist governments everywhere. So I think that uh, uh, there is definitely a demand for go more government intervention that will not go away fast. And this is where I agree with Richard, business plays a crucial role because the more the business can substitute some of the, the role of government, the less demand for government there will be. The more the business uh, behaves in a very uh, narrow way, the more the demand for government will uh, increase and stay there. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, that I, I don't see questions coming in from, from the audience. I think it's a fascinating conversation. So I'm going to ask you all one question. Uh, as you reflect back on what has been an extraordinary six to eight weeks and from all the different perspectives where you're sitting, um, you know, as you try to keep your operations and your business uh, afloat and make very difficult decisions and you've tried to work with all the stakeholders that you have, what have you learnt about leadership? And I'll begin with you, Commissioner. Well, in line with what uh, your findings in the Edelman Trust uh, barometer has just uh, given us today, uh, it certainly indicates that if we work together and cooperate together, we can achieve a lot rather than engage in confrontation. And uh, we see the evidence of this in the trade area in particular. Since the establishment of, of GATT after the Second World War, in the last 70 years, we have 250 times increase in the GDP of the member countries. And uh, that's a lesson to be learned that I think that, uh, you know, increasing uh, trade disputes unnecessarily, imposing additional costs on people through tariffs doesn't work. Uh, secondly, I, I would think that people individually uh, will certainly change their habits and digital trade will become more and more, as Andy has said, I agree totally, that uh, what we have now uh, come to do ourselves and our companies in the last three months is effectively bringing forward the reform agenda on e-commerce. E 
And we have to create the, adapt to these rules and new mechanisms of trade by working globally and working together around those rules to make sure that people get and the consumers get what they expect and that there's redress if they don't. So the rules and disciplines around digital trade that are in negotiation at the moment in the World Trade Organization, we should complete them as soon as possible because this is going to be exponentially huge in the next uh, short period of time. So there are the two issues. And the final issue we have learned in the European Union is that we, we, we call it now strategic autonomy. So strategic autonomy is, is, is not about self-sufficiency because you cannot manufacture everything uh, for everybody in your own region. We depend on each other. But also we reflect on the fact that there are some products, particularly in the health and pharmaceutical area, where we do need and we do see the vulnerability. And we need to look at this in terms of, like we did with the oil crisis in the 1970s, that some reshoring, but also stockpiling in order to be better prepared for a future pandemic if it comes along, or any future crisis. So these are the lessons about planning ahead, planning better, using international organizations better in terms of member countries of any international organization coming together more closely in order to work together, we'll get results. Uh, and therefore we should build on the confidence that we're getting from this parameter of trust in government frontline services and government agencies and institutions that they can deliver. Thank you. David, what have you learned about leadership in the past six to eight weeks? Well, the, uh, the framework we use to think about leadership, uh, we call smart heart and courage. So we evaluate our leaders on those three dimensions. Um, and we know that they're important to the success in our business and almost any business. It's not really that deep because it sort of comes from the Wizard of Oz, but it, it works for us. And, uh, you know, I, I knew going into this that, you know, smart and hard, we, it's easy to hire people with that. The, the, the hardest trait to hire is courage and to see how people will behave during uh, trying times because you can't really test for that in an interview. Um, what I've seen, you know, in our company and others is you're seeing a lot of courageous people step up. Uh, and tackle this thing head on. There's two kinds of mindsets right now. There's the woe is me and the panic, and then there's the let's lead from the front, let's make decisions with incomplete data, which takes a lot of courage, um, and let's have a bias for action. Now, certainly, you know, I've certainly seen some leaders that have a bias for inaction. That's incredibly dangerous at this time um, because days, when the, when the crisis unfolded, days matters, everything mattered. <clears throat> and the more urgent you acted, the more likely you were to get through this um, in a better way. Thankfully, I was inspired by our team and how they reacted with that bias for action and stepped up with that courage. I think the other thing is um, the ability to communicate in an authentic way is important right now. When this first hit, we started doing video chats with the entire company. And uh, surprisingly, the things people appreciated most was when I said, look, I don't have the answers. Yeah, they, you know, they, they, they wanted to hear that we had all the answers, but I think it gave them comfort that we were working on it and that we were going to be authentic and transparent with them through the journey, as all of our other leaders are in the company. We pride ourselves on that part of our culture. Um, so I think you learn a little bit about the importance to communicate. When people are isolated right now, um, just this kind of communication just gives them a little sense of normalcy, even if it's not physically in person. And uh, we've, we've been doing a lot more of that kind of large group video chats, which I think have helped us get through this in this time and I think would be helpful to others. Andy, what, what have you thought about leadership in these past few weeks? Uh, first of all, I agree uh, violently with what the commissioner and, and David has said, and I would add to that the importance of uh, brutal honesty, uh, hope, and purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this has been a really interesting time for all of us as leaders, and I think it would be very easy to um, toss out a platitude and make everyone feel better. And I think the most important thing that we have to do is, is tell people what we know, and as David said, what we don't know. Uh, tell them the bad news and tell them as brutally, honestly as you can what the bad news is. And then I think you have to let people know what you see in the future. And I think we all have reasons to hope uh, Oscar knows that one day we'll all go back to Fiji again or, or whatever that might be. We will get to the other side of this. So I think honesty coupled with the hope to get to the other side is critical. And, you know, my company has always been a very purpose driven organization and we manufacture and we've manufactured essential products throughout this entire crisis. So we've had people on the front lines, just like David and many of you have. Um, 
before we knew what proper PPE would be for this. And when you have people that are in there making tables for hospital bedsides, uh, they know they're not just making furniture, they're making a difference. So I think really recalibrating on your purpose and driving home your purpose as a company uh, right now is unifying and, and critically important. Thank you for that perspective. Oscar, how about for you for the past few weeks? Oh, you're on mute. I was saying I appreciated the time to think about that, that <laughs> question I, and the profound answers from the team. I think I couldn't agree more. Um, I would boil it all down with violent agreement, as someone said, but there's a concept that I've always used in leadership, and it's simple and straightforward. It's proof, not promise, meaning you can say all of these things, but you have to act them out. You have to put them into place. People have to genuinely feel that you mean the things that you're saying, whether it's brutal honesty or, or, or transparency. All of those things, I think, are really, really important. Um, I think the other thing that I've learned that the, the, the level of personal engagement as leaders is critical around whatever topic or subject that you see sort of surface. I, I, I have learned clearly that things are not in our control. And something like this, I think Lincoln said it best, that public sentiment is everything. Without it, nothing succeeds. You know, with it, everything can, I mean, everything can, can succeed. Something like that. I always get those things screwed up. But the concept is, um, governments and industry is not going to declare the virus over and markets open. Public sentiment is. And that public sentiment, in my opinion, is you know, this, this debate that is being had between uh, livelihood and, and protecting livelihoods and protecting lives. Um, that's just a very, it doesn't reflect the, the lived reality of, of Americans, certainly. Uh, there are people, th these essential workers, as we call them, who going to work and being safe is the same thing to some degree. And I don't think we can ever put, we should never put people in that category, that forcing this weird sort of, you know, false choice of things. Uh, and so my thought there is to be more holistic. And what I'm doing at BRT and other places is getting all of us to think about the fact that, you know, office space and Andy, David's restaurants, um, the, the trade that the commissioner spoke about, the intellect around the economy, all of that is one giant ecosystem that's intertwined. And we can't just look singularly at our world and our industry without understanding the impact on others. We're in a horrible place, but without everyone, everybody else sort of coming alive, I'm never gonna get there. And so focusing on that public sentiment from a personal sort of motivation is probably one of the biggest actions that I'm taking personally. Well, we, uh, we're on time. I'm going to hand back to Richard. But what I do want to say is just thank you all for those incredibly diverse and very thought-provoking, inspiring perspectives. I mean, I think you really shared a lot about what it's like uh, in, in very different sectors. So thank you very much for, for joining us today. And back to you, Richard. So I concluded uh, my trust uh, remarks um, with a really urgent call to action. This is the moment for business to lead. This is the moment for all of you to be <clears throat> front and center with your CEOs. Please go into their offices and reflect what David and Oscar and Andy have said. Please be clear about four things. Employees, matter most. You have to protect them and also your customer health. The second is automation is going to be inevitable in the next phase, but you have to do rescaling. People are going to judge you for this. Supply chain, please include small business, um, give them better credit terms, and also include the idea of sustainability. Don't walk away from sustainability. And fourth, rejig, rejig your products so that the less well off have products for them too. This mass class divide can really be a huge problem and it's also a business opportunity. There's never been a more important time for communications, for communicators, for all of us who are in the business of ideas and of purpose. So I thank you all for joining today's call. I deeply appreciate all of our panelists who are many of whom are very good friends of mine. And so with that, we will conclude and um, we'll be back to you uh, in mid-June with a study about brands in the time of COVID and how brands are to operate in a forward play. Thank you all. Bye-bye.